actually the term AME gets used in a couple areas now. Uh, one, it gets covered with uh, traditional printed electronics where you, you have a substrate like a flex board and you print some conductors and dielectrics on top and then you, like it's common to have a die and you just print onto the die, no wire bonds. Then the AME area we're trying to standardize on, you start with nothing. You, you start with a, with a steel plate per se, put a piece of uh, Kapton on it and you print the entire board. Okay, so everything is additive, you know chemistries, you don't throw anything away, there's no panels. The issue with, with AME right now with the, globally is they're, they're small print areas, like six by six and maybe three, four, five millimeters tall. So you can't make large backplanes, it doesn't exist yet. And, but the fundamental, it's really interesting that when you look at how is it different than PCB, different materials, uh, we don't plate, we don't drill. There's two different uses by customers. One is you treat it like a circuit board. You have layers and you have vias and holes. So you route it out like you do in a normal, normal board. The other way is you do 3D uh, features like a mechanical CAD. You have traces that go in an angle. The trace can be star-shaped. Uh, we don't have edges, you have surfaces. So it can be round. Uh, it's common to have an antenna. We have multiple antennas sticking off the top. If you want to have a creep, uh, worry about voltage creep, you just make a, a, a tall print up a little taller so it has to crawl up and over it. You can't do that on circuit boards. It'll never replace circuit board technology. Nothing ever does. But it's, it's a good way to create uh, custom shapes, which say you can't do traditionally. AME right now, is, 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 is you look at cost, there's, there's two costs you got to look at. Recurring treatment and, um, and cycle time is actual cost. A lot of companies will have to write a purchase order, go through purchasing, place it, go quote it with five vendors, and do there's cost involved in that whole quoting process. A lot of people are buying a machine, putting it downstairs, if they want to make a prototype, they send the file down, hit a button, and it prints. So there's no cycle time, no purchasing, no paperwork involved, which is quite interesting for especially research organizations and a lot of uh, captive IP companies. The cost is high. If you're looking at a per square foot base, it's higher even higher than uh, a very low loss materials. The advantages are you can start doing 3D shapes that you can't do in a circuit board. So we can replace two or three boards with one board. If you want to make something that's round, you print something that's round. Uh, people make pills. They put a camera on the end, a battery at the other, you swallow it, and the features are round, the parts are mounted on certain areas, and they drive it around inside your body with a magnet. It creeps me out. But um, there's a lot of these new applications you can't do with a traditional circuit board, even flex or rigid flex. So, um, and it's true additive. We have additive plating in, in, in circuit boards, so this is true additive. All the material stays within the substrate you're making. So it's, uh, from an environmental standpoint, you don't have anything you throw away. There's nothing that goes down the, down the sink, nothing goes up in the air. Uh, so it's, it's pure, everything you print gets used. If you're making Small devices, like modules, IC packages, uh, specific small IoT devices that don't, and you're not going to make a lot of them. See, I need three. It's okay. So, in those cases, it's actually better to use additive manufacturing. And one area that, that's really used a lot is uh, I have a design, I don't know if it's really right yet, the shape is right. So, I'll make a prototype to board shop, get the boards back. No, it's wrong. Two weeks later, he sent another. Uh, two weeks later, he sent another one. On this, what a lot of people are doing this. Yeah, in your print area, you print five different versions at the same time in, in one print. So if you're like printing one prototype with five totally different boards, you can take all these off the next morning and go see which one works. It's a real fast cycle time. Um, but if you're doing a large networking board or so, oh, is that gonna work? It's not the right, right not the right application. When it comes, when it comes up, uh, this is how we defined AME and IPC and, and ASTM. You want to call it a board, we, we call it an AME, not a board, like FPC. You take it off your machine, you can go in and start assembling it. And actually in some applications, people will do the uh, embedded component assembly in parallel with the same machine while it's actually being fabricated. So when you, when you take it off, it's ready to be soldered. It's a, usually a silver paste, a silver material. So you can, you can use uh, adhesives or low temp solders with them. You, if you want to go in and gold plate it, go ahead and gold plate it. If you want to conformally coat it, assemble it, go conformally coat it like you do regular boards, but you don't have to do it. You literally take it off and either have it assembled while you're making it or go ahead and assemble it.
in 3D AME, the concept of a via goes away. When you go vertical, you can go at angles. We call it a 3DT, three-dimensional traces. A via in, in our world is just the shape of a trace. If you want it to be round, go ahead and make it round. If you want a hole down the middle, put a hole down the middle of it, who cares? A hole now is not created by drilling and plating and cleaning. You just don't put anything there. When you print along the axis, if you want a hole here, you print, 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 no print, 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 print. And that's how you build it up. So the concept of layers, depending on whether you're doing 2D designs or 3D designs is a good question. If you're doing a traditional circuit board 2D design where you have vias and you have horizontal layers, uh, you can create the exact thing. Your via, you can just make it be a vertical uh, trace. You don't have to have the hole in the pad because registration is measured in microns as you're printing. So if you think of a board, say I have a uh, six layer board, and I have two power planes here, and I have three mils of dielectric. Well, I'm printing, depends on the printer, I'm printing say 18 microns of material back and forth creating that separation. We call those loosely defined right now as slices. So when you want to build a say layer three, four, you're actually building six slices, four in here, one here, one here. And this layer in a traditional board may be power plane and have traces on it. Uh, to this technology, you just print the conductor or the dielectric, whatever you want, wherever you want it. So the idea of vias is interesting. We're gonna try, try and remove that from people's heads. Is, is no such thing as a via. Just call it a 3D trace. A good example of that is a ball grid array. You have a ball grid array, you have uh, your, your pad on the top, you wanna to put a laser via through it down, down to your target pad, and see so your via connects here. Well, so you gotta have a pad on layer two, obviously the mounting pad on layer one. In additive, I need the pad on layer one. If I'm gonna go down, I just run a trace up to it. I don't need another pad, I don't need the hole. So if you look at BGA routing versus traditional, you have say BGA pads out this way on layer one. On layer two, you have no pads, so Instead of having two track at 50 micron, I can have seven track going out, so reduce a lot of layers. So it's a very good question. It's going to be hard for designers to quit, including my own companies, quit calling it Vias, call it 3DTs. Yeah. Yeah, most of the technologies available today uh, can only go down to 75 micron for, for AME, true full build structures. It can only go down to 70, 75 micron, so uh, Ultra HDI, we're not there yet. The, the uh, nanoparticle conductors and the print head resolution can't get us down narrow enough yet, but it's coming, it's just a matter of time. You look at the, the what's available today in the AME world, it's more of a HDI level of technology, not a ultra HDI yet. If you flip it over and you look at printed electronics from that, there's printed electronics folks that are making five micron traces now, three micron traces, printing onto something. So it's not a full build, but it's a printed additively onto another substrate. That's already available in the market. The reason I, I got into this two years ago was there were no standards. It's not a circuit board. Uh, there's a lot of things you standardize in circuit boards like hole wall quality, drill holes, registration, uh, back drilling. All these things don't exist in this technology because you're adding everything. So we took the traditional 6012, 6013 spec. Oh yeah, I should also mention too, when we make boards, we make both rigid flex and rigid flex at the exact same time using the exact same materials. So you don't need to have three different standards. We created just one performance standard. We created a second standard for inspection like the A600 document because a lot of the inspection criteria is different because the shapes, and the, like when laser vias came out, the shape wasn't good until it figured out five years later it actually was good. Same thing will happen here. And then coupons, we don't, 2D coupons don't make sense in a 3D world. So we're developing a, a separate standard which doesn't have a number yet on 3D coupons in IPC. And actually they're meeting this week on the, on the other coast having a meeting on this. From a non-IPC standpoint for ASTM and ISO, I chair the ASTM committee on AME, uh, F42.07.06. So we're, used, we're gonna work jointly together along with the Europeans to create one set of standards for AME across the whole world. So we don't have conflicting standards like we have today. So it's brand new, the first, the first version will probably be are on target to be released sometime in 2025. We'll start seeing them. And then we'll go immediately into Rev1, yeah, <laughs> like every other standard. So the, the primary issue with the current materials available worldwide is they don't like 260C reflow. 
Uh, some of them can go to 240, 245. Uh, so when you're making a pure AME board, I'm just gonna mount parts onto it. People are using low temperature solders like 180C, uh, various, various alloys of, of low temp solders. Also using adhesives, you know, you solder it all. And actually the standards we're writing were, we're adding in sections so that adhesive bonding and low temperature bonding it will be allowed with test methods. Because you don't need it, the materials can't survive it, you don't need it to mount a part to it. You just have to get it attached. And, and adhesives are gonna be more and more popular as we go along, not solder. The issue comes in is I make a module, now I wanna go stick it onto a big board that's gonna get 260C refilled. That's the problem right now. They can't do it right now. So there's a lot of material development going on to create materials that are good at 240, 245C, you know, 6X, 10X cycles and working towards 260C. So from an assembly standpoint, the reflow temperature is the issue. The part man and everything else is standard, except now you can do stuff on angles. You can mount on angles now, which traditional pick and places can't do. From a, from a 3D, how's it different than 2D from an assembly standpoint? Um, I was on a, on a uh, um, ANSI uh, roadmap uh, two years ago, adding AME to the gap analysis for additive manufacturing. There were several hundred people on the call. One person stopped my explanation why we needed it. He said, why do we need electronics and additive manufacturing? It's just steel, ceramic, and plastic. I don't understand. So I thought for a second, I said, well, you guys, t make, you, you make an additive spring, right? Make a spring with a coil on it. We take that spring, put it into a board, hook two wires up to it and call it an inductor. It's the same form factor. Okay, so the differences are we have a lot of ability to create 3D components inside the board as you're building it up. Uh, capacitors, multi-plate capacitors, uh, resistors with resistive material, uh, coils, uh, uh, coax transmission lines, twisted pair lines, all those can be created inside the board or on the surface as you're making it. You can't do that in a circuit board. It's really hard to make a true coax in a circuit board. I've done it before using laser blind vias. Really hard. So. Then you look at the design side, with all the design tools assume everything's what I call 2.5D, layers and vertical holes, and that's your world. So now you want to start creating coils and transmission lines, things go at angles. I want to create antennas that stick off the top, stick off the side, all these features that go up or go out at an angle. I want to create planes that go at an angle. You have to do that in mechanical CAD tools right now. So the people are designing the 3D shapes from a circuit board standpoint, often start in mechanical CAD world, create the design in, in mechanical CAD, output a 2581 or Gerber ODB file. We have CAM tools on the machines to merge these things together to, to create slices. We just think of it as like an artwork layer, as a slice, or a photo plot layer. And then we merge them all together into something we can build. So you, you get into a 3D world for embedded and surface components, along with place components, can all be done at the same time. So it's, it's a lot of, it's a different design mentality and, and process to use. All the seven known techniques for editor manufacturing are being used today, all of them. The standards we're writing, we're, we're, be, we're being uh, very cognizant about that. We're not writing for inkjet printing, which is the most common one. Uh, there's a group in Singapore and some in the U.S. just talked about they're creating traces by using FDD process where you, you draw you, you print out your metal as you draw and create your traces, okay? Well, that process is fairly new, but it's a circuit board, so it's okay. So all the standards are different. The applications are different. If you're going on printed electronics, uh, aerosol jetting and those techniques are being used because of the fine feature sizes. They haven't got the tech processes set up yet to build up entire boards. The other concept that we haven't mentioned yet is people are printing semiconductors. They're printing skin. Okay, we're creating actual boards, AME things that can be attached to your skin with medical approvals or used inside your body that are used in non-traditional circuit board materials, either by themselves or in conjunction with traditional materials. So all, all the techniques are used in the world to some extent. Uh, inkjet printing is the most common one out there right now, but that's starting to change. Same challenges exist in the circuit board world. The difference is we don't go through high temperature lamination, so we don't have to worry about lamination processes and temperatures. The way we do it is we either form the, the component as we print, or if you want an embedded, say, IC inside the board, uh, there's one company out of Japan that has a, I keep doing this, it's a big wide unit, so I keep doing this, I'm seeing it in my brain. Uh, they do the print, then it moves over to the pick and place, they place the parts, 
then they bring it back in, continue printing. So the, the direction, long-term direction will be a pick and place unit will be used and, and, and solder paste, adhesive printing will all be done with basically two units stuck side by side. So your assembly and your fab process works together versus in different factories. I like to say a lot, of, like, I call it the three cubicle factory. The printer is one cubicle, the assembly and reflow is two cubicles. It's a three cubicle factory, I call it. So it's, instead of building boards, it's an assembly operation. The mentality is we're going to do them together and integrate the, the concept, which is really interesting. It's definitely different. So let's look at uh, the, the conductors first. Uh, most of the materials are uh, nano powder. Most of them are a nano silver material, or a combination silver, uh, not nano copper. Nano copper is being worked on. We're, it's getting close. The problem with nano material copper is the second you create the nanoparticle, it oxidizes instantaneously. So these little teeny tiny particles that can't bond. Okay, copper foil is plated up, and you don't have that problem. So everyone's using is a silver, most people are using a silver uh, material right now. You, you print it and center it as you're writing or as a secondary process. Depends on the application or the machine, I should say. So the conductivity is generally about 40% of, of copper foil, lower. But if you look at it, it's interesting. When you put copper foil on the circuit board, it never changes. It stays the same thickness, it stays the same conductivity, no matter what you do to it. It's always the same. Additive manufacturing, if you print your silver conductor on the bottom on a, on a heater and you start building up the layers, the bottom layer is actually center, but they stay heated longer. So as you go up, the conductivity of the material changes from the bottom to the top. Now, I've seen cases, been reported, where the silver actually will come out at a higher, con better conductivity than copper foil will under certain processing conditions. So generally speaking, we talk about it's about 40% of copper, but when you're making things this big, it's perfectly fine. It doesn't really matter at all. It's interesting, everyone compares it back to copper because that's what we do today. It's what everyone's used to. So eventually the coppers will come out because people want copper, lower conductivity. It's a matter of time until they, they come out. What's interesting in the performance, I've been kind of surprised in this area. A lot of the initial applications were in RF boards, antennas or RF modules, replacing like Rogers materials or high-end Arlon type materials. And they perform real well. And we still have some disagreement on what's going on here, but we don't have glass weave. We don't have chopped glass particles in here. It's pure resin. And they're generally nanoparticles. The signals actually have, operate at a higher loss on paper, if you do the traditional loss measurement, it's like 0.05, it's high for, a, for an RF material. The DKs are around four, four and a half versus two or something. But the performance at RF is better than traditional materials. We believe it's due to the nanoparticle and the, and the homogeneity of the, of the material itself. There's no changes, they're not multiple materials pasted in together. So it's real surprising, they actually work better than RF materials in a lot of cases. That's kind of been a lot of the first applications or antennas and RF modules out there. I've been trying to classify the nano materials in uh, IPC slice sheets, and they don't work. They're just totally different. Uh, they, the characteristics are different, some better, a lot worse, but they work good enough. We may eventually add it to the functional dielectric, functional uh, conductor specification at IPC instead because uh, they're different. I get asked a lot of times, well, should we have one in a prototype shop so we can build a board really quick, then switch over to FR4? Well, they're gonna be enough different that maybe it'll work, maybe we won't. We just don't know yet. We have a lot more work to do that in that space right now. But, yeah, they're, they're just gonna be different than F the traditional FR4 or low loss materials. We just have to understand why, how to use it better, and, and how to make it more com compatible back and forth. I can put a machine in this cubicle right here, put a pick and place next to it, put it in my basement. I don't need special power. I don't need special air conditioning. I, I don't need special venting. So a lot of these companies that are buying it now are putting it literally in the basement of their building. And they want to build a prototype. They send the file down from their desk and someone down there hits a button and they start two to 72 hours later, depends on the complexity. You have your prototype, but ah, they're printing five versions at the same time. Interesting, I don't have to send five different files to a vendor. So it'll dramatically reduce the cycle time of prototypes eventually for higher complexity type designs. 
Obviously, you can get two layer, single sided, four layer boards out in 24 hours today or, or less at pretty standard. These are the same size, will typically take about the same amount of time from that standpoint. In the longer term, this, the first applications will be quick turn prototype, rapid prototyping, we call it, in the industry. And then eventually, I could tell people, well, I, how can you go to volume? I go, well, have you ever been to a volume factory? I've worked in them. There's a hundred drill machines in there. They don't have one drill. There's a hundred of them in the room. So there'll probably be a hundred of these in there replacing the entire plating room, all the drill rooms, the legend room, the, all those rooms be gone full of these printers making prototypes. Eventually, not, not in the next two years, but, you know, but conceptually that's where it's heading. Yeah. And oh, I should probably mention a lot of the applications area is IP control. A lot, especially military, and a lot of companies don't want to send their designs outside their company yet. So now they can, this is simple enough processes to run, materials are easy enough to handle. They can do it in their basement, not have to go outside. So there's a lot of IP control that's being used in this area. Size, 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 and size. Uh, the, the machines just aren't big enough yet to do what I consider standard prototype. We need to have, in my mind, probably about an 18 by 24 panel, at least 12 by 18 panel size that can be printed at the same time. Uh, we're just not there yet. Uh, the current materials aren't strong enough to make something that big. They're, they're brittle. The newer materials are, are a lot less brittle. Uh, but it might, right now with the current speeds and everything, it might take uh, five weeks to print something that big. So everyone's working on faster carrying materials, faster print heads, faster everything, so you get to larger form factors. But it's really just the form factor size is the limiting factor, what I consider for a prototype shop. Unless you're making just really small IoT things, you could probably start converting now, but except for the materials are just not strong enough yet to handle the environment. The current predominant event, uh, customers are research organizations, uh, 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 universities, uh, military applications, looking at it for, for the next generation. Uh, this is already being, being uh, um, used in the industry for plastics and metals. In the military, there's, there's actually metal and plastic printers on top of, inside of aircraft carriers. Okay, I talked to someday a person, he said, work, work on the Mars project. And he goes, uh, we, we believe additive will be everything from Mars. You know why? You no, know why? He goes, we can't carry every spare part we need. If a wrench breaks, I can't wait two years to get another wrench. So we're actually, even going to the moon and Mars, we're looking at making everything additive. So if I want to make a wrench, I'll just print a wrench. If I need a screw, I'll print a screw. I don't need to inventory this stuff and carry it with me. So we're seeing that a lot in the spare parts area in the military, not in electronics yet, yet, but in the other areas where they're printing these printers out in the field to create spare parts. Because sometimes it might take nine months to get a spare part through the system to get it back to the person in the middle of a war zone or on a ship someplace. So they're already starting to think about how, how to use this to, to create it. They got over the problem a year ago where I, I was in a conversation where an Army person was saying, we have the printers out there, but the companies won't release their designs to us. They consider that IP. So how am I going to make it? They won't release me the design, but they figured out through the lawyers how to figure that problem out now. So There are no standards for quality and performance and, and um, environmental use yet for AME. That's what we're working on at IPC and ASTM and other organizations. The military is obviously tracking along this. Um, first, a large military company, I asked him one time, do you have standards on this? He goes, no, I don't have enough data yet to even think about what a standard would be. So there aren't any standards, so it's really I, it's really not well defined right now. That's why there's a lot of because a lot of people working on the IPC ASTM standards, trying to work together to take a best guess of what we know in circuit boards and apply it over here, because we know circuit boards work. So what is it we can apply over here, and how, what do we need to modify to make it uh, reflective of the technology? And we have a lot of testing to go through on the new coupons and stuff like that. So right now, it's still in its infancy. That's why you don't see mass deployment of anything yet, except for more research or very customized type applications. We know in the circuit board world, there's not enough designers coming out. We're trying to figure out how to get more designers. We're starting to rebuild factories again in the US, so there's not enough people know how to run an IC fab or a board fab shop. So there's a lot of schooling going on. In the additive world, we're doing the same thing. We're working with a lot of schools by selling them printers cheap or loaning them or giving them printers that will set up a curriculum for both additive for both metals, plastics, uh, ceramics, and also electronics. 
So we're trying to train the, the people out of school. Why? Well, if you don't know how to do a circuit board, I don't have to untrain you to do an AME. If I train you as an AME or an additive person, you're going to get there a lot faster. So it's basically, we're in, there's a lot of activity going on around the world on training people in this area, and including PhD and master's students coming out that uh, this is all they know. And a lot of those are in the RF world, you know, uh, because making antennas and shapes like that. So it's a traditional problem we have in our industry is how do we get new people trained in this? We're doing the same exact thing. Because you got to think 3D, you know, and it's really hard to do when you've been thinking 2D for most of your life. Yeah.